Well, again, good morning. Uh, I'm excited to be here this morning. What a beautiful day we have. Uh, we're going to continue. This is Missions Month, so we're going to continue our missions theme. Uh, so why don't you stand uh, and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, as we continue our missions theme and evangelism theme, uh, which has worked out awesome because... We just had an awesome testimony, 80 teenagers out of 320, right? Out of 350, 80 of them, 80 gave their life to Christ. How awesome is that? I mean, that's, that is what that's about. That's, I mean, camp is, and you heard it from all the guys, the amazing testimonies of all the fun they got to do, but the whole purpose of that is to open up hearts, tear down walls for uh, the gospel to be able to be preached for people's lives to be changed. And, and we see some great examples of the, not only the 80 who gave their life to Christ, but the others who had their lives changed. And we heard some testimonies of that. So I want to continue that theme, if you will. In Matthew chapter 28, I want to read verses 16 through 20. These are the verses that are uh, referred to as the Great Commission, uh, God commissioning us to, uh, to action. In verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. And Jesus closes that with amen. So Father God, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for those teenagers uh, who are at camp this week. Lord, we thank you for the lives that were drastically transformed. Those who uh, came to know you, Lord Jesus, as their Savior. Those who recommitted their lives to you and those who uh, gained the understanding of what it is to live life for you, uh, even in uh, the world that we live in. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time. I thank you for each and every one uh, that's here this morning. I thank you for those testimonies that we've already heard. Lord, and I thank you for each and every penny that was given this morning to change the world for missions. And Father God, I ask that you would just uh, speak through me this morning, that your Holy Spirit would just move mightily in our midst, and that we would receive and that we would have a life change as well. And I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Um, how many of you have heard the, uh, I mean, you guys understand, right? How many of you have heard of like mission strategies, right? There's different strategies to, to reach, you know, how you do missions, you know, whether you do this much uh, local, this much uh, world. Well, how many of you have ever heard the mission strategy uh, that is the Coca-Cola mission strategy? And, okay, how many of you, just a quick informal poll, how many of you have ever heard of the soda Coca-Cola? Okay, that's good. How many of you have ever seen a bottle or can of Coca-Cola? Everybody should raise their hand because that's what I have in my hand. So if you can see this, you have seen one. All right, so pretty much everybody. How many of you have ever tasted Coca-Cola? Don't be ashamed. Okay, that's good. That's a mission strategy. Did you realize that? It's a mission strategy. Interesting thing about Coca-Cola, many of you know the, the story of Coca-Cola, but I want to share it with you a little bit. It's, it's definitely outgrown its humble beginnings. Coca-Cola, uh, in 1886, 1886, Dr. John Pemberton first introduced Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia. They'd already lost the war at that point because they, you know, Coca-Cola. Anyway, the pharmacist concocted a caramel-colored syrup in a three-legged brass kettle in his backyard. Coca-Cola began in the backyard of a pharmacist. He first distributed it, if you will, by carrying it in a jug down the street to Jacob's Pharmacy. That's how Coca-Cola began, right? A, one person created the product and then started distributing it, if you will, to one pharmacy in a small little area. Now, here we are uh, over 100 years later, and the surveys show this. This is pretty staggering. 97% of the world, the entire world, 
has heard of Coca-Cola. 97% of the entire world has heard of Coca-Cola. 72% of the world has seen in person a can or bottle of Coca-Cola. 51% of the entire world has tried and tasted Coca-Cola. And this is all because really we had the, at some point, at one point, the Coca-Cola company had a mission that their mission was to, for everyone in the world to have a Coke. Everyone. That was their mission. Their mission was that everyone in the world would be really, uh, I mean, brainwashed or whatever word you want to use, uh, introduced to, indoctrinated with uh, Coca-Cola. That was their mission. Their mission was to go make sure everybody in the world knew about them. It started with one person in a little uh, area in his backyard, created this, and now the whole world, uh, almost the entire world, knows and has heard about Coca-Cola. That's incredible. And the reason I say the mission statement of it is because that was Coke's vision, right? Their vision was that everybody would experience Coca-Cola. Jesus, in the words that we just read, said to his disciples that it was their mission, their humble beginnings, if you will, would be to go into all of the world, all of the world, right? All of the world. That's what he said. You'll go into all of the world and you'll make disciples. You'll teach them all the things that I've taught you. And you're going to do that. That's your job. So his mission statement was this. He wanted everybody in the world to experience the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody. He wanted everybody to be part of that. He called his disciples. He said, listen, this is going to be your job. Your job is going to be to go into all of the world and preach the gospel. That's your job. And that wasn't just the job of the 11 disciples that were there. That's the job of every believer is to go into all of the world, whatever part of the world. We talked about last week, there are different places, right? Uh, missions can be done at home. It can be done in school. It can be done at work. It can be done in our neighborhoods, in, in our cities, our towns, our state, our nation. Our nation desperately needs the gospel. It was Jesus' mission statement that the whole world would hear the gospel. It's Jesus, it's God's heart that none should perish, that everyone would be saved. So how are we doing as a church? How are we doing as the church of Christ? Well, there was a uh, evangelism statistics that were put together by Acts Evangelism out of Washington State. And this is what they found in their evangelism statistics of the church in America. 95% of all Christians said they have never won a soul to Christ. 95% of Christians surveyed. I'm sure it was just because of the survey. I'm sure that number's much, much lower throughout the world. 95%, 95 out of 100 Christians have never once ever led a soul to Christ. Never. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Go into all the world. Make disciples. Teach them all the things I've taught you. 95% haven't done it. 80% of all Christians said that they do not consist, they are not consistently a witness for Christ. So 95% have never led anybody to the Lord. 85% said we're not even a consistent witness for Christ. I mean, that, that's, I mean, at least they were honest. But that honesty is not a good, that's not good. So here we are, tasked with the job to go into all of the world, to, to preach the good news, to bring the good news to everybody, to make disciples, and 95% of the people have never done it. 85% of the people said they don't consistently do it. Less than 2% said they are actively involved in the ministry of evangelism. Less than 2%. So that leads me to ask this question. And this is going to sound kind of harsh, and it's meant to. Here's my question. If less than 2% of Christians say that they're actively involved in evangelism efforts, 
Are the other 98% that aren't doing it, are they, do they not care that people are going to hell? Do they only care about meeting their needs? Or, or are we just too lazy to do it? We just don't want to take the time to do it? Or are we too afraid to do it? None of those answers to me really give me any sort of uh, comfort. It certainly doesn't comfort uh, the estimated 1.7 billion people who are uh, worldwide who don't have regular access to the gospel because of the areas that they're in. It doesn't give me, it doesn't give me a, a warm and fuzzies knowing that we're not doing what God has called us to do for whatever reason we're not called, that we're not doing it. So there's really not a good reason why we're not. Because what would be, what would be our good excuse? Um... I mean, like, seriously, what, what's the, what is the good excuse that you can't be a witness to Christ everywhere you are? Everything that you're doing. I'm not saying you have to go out and knock on every single door in the country and start handing out tracts. I'm not saying that. But being a witness to what Christ has done for us is just, is as simple as being who God has created you to be. Amen. There's a, a, a story of a girl in Sunday school, and she's driving home with her mom, and uh, she says to her mom, she says, Mom, I... You know, she's kind of perplexed. She's, you know, like eight or nine. And um, her mom said, well, what's the matter? She says, well, she said, the, the, the Sunday school teacher told me that God is everywhere, that he's so big that he's everywhere all the time. Is that true? And her mom says, yes, of course. God is everywhere at once, you know. It's con called being omnipresent. Okay. Well, but then the pastor said, that God lives inside of each and every one of us. Is that true? And the mom says, well, yeah. You know, become a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit's God, he lives inside of us. So yes, God lives inside of us. And she says, well, if God is so big and he lives inside of us, then shouldn't people see him when they look at us? This is a, a, a Sunday school kid who totally gets it. Like, Shouldn't people see God in me if God is in me and he's so big that he can't be hidden? And, and here's the, the amazing thing. That's absolutely true. That's the first step, really, of evangelism is just being who God has created you to be. Letting the God who lives inside of you, uh, let him have a little bit of air and let the world see him in you. So his commission that he gave to the disciples is the mission, is our mission as believers and as a church. And I just want to go quickly this morning through five different things that this means to us. Five different uh, things that are, are part of this going. Part of this mission, if you will, for us to be uh, who God's created us to be. To go and do what God has called us to do. Now make no mistake, th there is nobody who is a believer that is not called to be an evangelist. Nobody. So, no excuse. You can't say, oh, I'm not really an evangelist. Well, by the pure definition of the fact that if you are a believer in Christ, you are called, that is your job, that is your mission. You know, Pastor Adam talked about last uh, week, you know, our mission is to hand off to the next generation. Well, I would say that's absolutely 100% true, and if studies are, are showing us anything, we're not doing a very good job of it. We've dropped the baton. In fact, I would hazard to say that we haven't dropped the baton. We haven't even started the race. The generation before us has started and they ran and they handed it off. I'm speaking my generation here, right? And they handed it off to my parents. And my parents' generation came and they handed it off to me. And now I'm saying that we're looking at statistics saying that, you know, 98% of people don't actually evangelize. I would say that it seems like uh, with my generation, we've either dropped the baton or they handed it to us and we just walked off the track. We're just sitting on the side waiting for the race to be over. It's like, oh, well, you know, I've got, I've got the baton. I've got my Jesus. I've got my Savior. I'm good to go. It's not how the races run. It's not what we're called to do. It's interesting here 
uh, the first principle I want us to understand is that there's, there is a need for praise, right? In verse 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Our motivation to share the gospel has to come out of an overflow of our worship of him. If we don't worship God, there won't be any uh, need, there won't be any excitement, there won't be any push within us to go and to do it. Because how are we going to go and share with people something that we don't even experience ourselves? How would we go to the world and say, "Hey, you need to worship God, the one true God, the God of the Bible." Really, how do you do that? Oh, I don't know. I don't do it. But you got to. It's a do as I say, not as I do kind of a thing, right? You need Jesus. Why? What does Jesus do? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven uh, because of what Jesus did. So that's all, I, that's all I'm really in for it, right? So much of the world today wants enough of Jesus to stay out of hell, but not enough of Jesus to actually change their life in any way. They want their eternity changed, but they don't want their now changed. I want to live my life now without Jesus, but have him in, you know, the get out of jail free card, right, that I'm going to hold on to in my game of Monopoly till I really, really, truly need it. Or oh, I'm a card carrying member of the Jesus crew, so whenever I need special access, when something goes bad in my life, I just pull that baby out. Boom, I've got Jesus. Oh, okay. Problem solved then. No difficulties. Our motivation for telling others about Christ grows out of our worship for him. Do you understand? When we worship, the, the, the teens were talking about it. The, the difference that it makes, the, the difference that it makes when you see a room full of people praising and worshiping God. It changes you. It allows you to be different. It allows you to, to, to step up. Right? We see it at Iron Sharpens Iron. You see the diversity of the people there. And you see uh, people who are just, I mean, their hands are up and they're waving them and they're dancing and they're saying hallelujah and they're praising God that way. And then you see the, you know, the, the, the frozen chosen who are just like singing the song, right? And then you see the something in between sometimes. You see the people who are like, you know, amen, right? Some, you know, amen. Right, there's a great comedian that talks about the different uh, praise things, you know, like carry the TV, you know, touchdown. Yeah, there's just different, uh, you know, the fishermen. Anyway, but so there's different ways that we praise Jesus, but we, we have to have some sort of praise for him. So our, our mission, the, the, the need for our worship is what, uh, is what keeps bringing us deeper. And the deeper we fall in love with Jesus, the more committed we are to obey him because the better we know him. Right, when we truly understand, and I've said this before, I would gladly give up everything else that we do as a church, everything that we do, if and only if we would get two things down, each and every one of us, two things. If we would know who we are in Christ, if we would truly understand who God says that you are, how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, what he did for you, who he says you are, you're his masterpiece, you're his choice possession, you are, uh, the, you are his plan A and there is no plan B to share with the world. I mean, you are his child. I mean, think about that. If we understood that, it would be awesome, right? So I would give up everything for that. And number two, I would give up everything if we also took that and you just simply were and did who God says you are and to do. Because if we understood, I mean, if we really truly had the, the, the same mindset that Coke has, that everybody in the world is going to experience the gospel, we're going to bring it to everybody, which is what we're called to do, by the way. If we would ever had that mindset, if we said, hey, you know what? I want the gospel in the hands of every single person. I want every single person to drink of the water that quenches the thirst forever, right? So they won't be thirsty. I want to make sure everybody gets that. And if that was our mission, and if we truly believed that, and, and I say truly believed it, because there's something that's missing between what we say and what we're doing. And I think that is our real belief in. Right? Because fear is normal in that we will be afraid. Things will bring fear into our life. But fear won't stop us if we understand who we are in Christ, 
right? And fear won't stop us if we understand that we're called and we believe in the mission that God has set before us. Because we won't be afraid. What are we going to be afraid of? We're going to be afraid of the world, right? Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Oh, okay. We're going to be afraid of the enemy. Jesus crushed the serpent's head under his foot. So, you know, I mean, we have nothing to fear. Even spiders. That's a tough one for me. I'm telling you right now, and I mean this, I would crawl through a room full of spiders if it meant one person was going to come to know the Lord. And I hate spiders. I would, I would hate every minute of it, but I would know it's huge. <laughs> All right. All the night will go. Right? We'll just push them out of the way. But think about that. That's, that's a better idea. Right? That's one of the races you don't have to win. Right? You just have to be faster. They only want to be slower. Like, let them eat on him. And while they're eating on him, just... Anyway. It's a good thought. So we have to have that praise. In other words, we have to... And then the second thing is we have to have a, a principle of privilege. Jesus came and spoke to them. God speaks today to us. What a privilege that is. Well, what a privilege it is to have a relationship with God. And he not only can, but he does speak. He still speaks today. I and mean, that's an amazing thing. I mean, it's like we have the privilege of a God who wants a relationship with us. And not just a relationship of do this, do this, do this, but a relationship of, hey, how are you doing today? Not very good, God. Why? Well, this is what's going on in my life. Come with me. I mean, even the disciples, Jesus said, come with me. I will teach you to be fishers of men. God said, I'm not going to just send you out there to do it. I'm going to equip you to be able to do it. It's a privilege to be able to do it. It's a privilege to be able to share the gospel with people. I mean, think about it. These 11, d despite all of their failures and all of their shortcomings, their insecurities and their fears... Jesus had prepared them to be witnesses to the whole world. He had prepared them, equipped them, and then sent them and said, hey, this is your job. This is what you're going to do. We have been given the greatest privilege of all time. It's a responsibility, but it's not a burden. It's a responsibility that we've been given to share the gospel. But it's only a burden when we're doing it on our own, when we're doing it because we have to, not out of the worship that we just talked about, right? When I'm worshiping God, I can't help but see, I can't help but God to show through, right? Uh, you can't, it, it's really difficult to praise God and worship him with nobody knowing, right? Because something's going to give it away, right? The, people are going to see it. They're going to be like, hey, you're at work. Why are you smiling? Because I love my job. You're lying. What's going on? No, really, that's what I've always wanted to do. That's not what you said yesterday. I'm here. It's Monday. Yeah. Why are you happy? Or you're going through a difficult challenge. I mean, something really tough in your life. Wow, what do you mean you're... How do you have confidence that you're going to get better? How do you have confidence you're going to get through this? What do we tell them? Oh, I know somebody. Yeah, you know somebody. His name is Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. You might as well just tell them who you know. Right? Because you never know. Maybe they're part of the 98% that know, but aren't saying anything either. And then you don't have to be afraid. That's one less person you have to evangelize. <coughs> it's a good thing. As, he, as I said, we're not, we have this privilege that God has given to us. And do you understand in verse 18 what this means? We've been given a provision of power. All right, Jesus said, came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Who is calling them to go and do this? Jesus. So by what authority are we going out into the world? Jesus' authority. Right? I don't have any authority in the world. I mean, I can go to a lot of places and people will be like, like I come in the name of Mike Furlan, they're going to be like, who? Mike Furlan, you haven't heard of him? No. Well, it's me. 
Who are you? I'm Mike Furland. I don't know you. You have no authority here, right? I mean, that's the truth. But when we come in the name of Jesus, who all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to, we're not coming in our name, we're coming in his name. And he's been given all authority. So it's like, I'm coming in the name of Jesus. You see, when we walk into a room and the enemy's already in that room and he's like scaring people and there's all these different things and he's like, ah, right? And you're coming in and you're like, I come in the authority of Mike Furlan. And they're like, oh, who? Right? But when you walk into that room and you're saying, I'm coming in the name of Jesus. What? Who do you say? Do you say Jesus? Yeah, I said Jesus. Uh-oh. <coughs> We're in trouble now. Right? Because they have to flee. You think about the, uh, the, the man who is demon-possessed and Jesus shows up. And they're like, they go to him and they're like, come on. Like, don't, don't do us like this, Jesus. This is messed up. Like, come on. Don't, don't, you know, what are you doing? And Jesus is like, you know what? Um, I go into the pigs. Oh, and they have to do it because he has been given the authority. We've been given that power and authority of it. It's interesting uh, on most the cans and, and bottles of Coca-Cola, um, you, you see, you'll see like who, who the dispenser of it is, right? Like where, uh, and what that means is they've been given the authority to produce and bottle Coca-Cola to bring it, to like ship it to their area. So they've been given by the, the, by the company, by Coca-Cola, the company, they've been given the power and authority to bottle it and hand it out, and they do it because they've been given that authority. Now, if I were to make Coca-Cola and go and start handing it out and selling it as Coca-Cola, I would get in trouble. I'd probably get a call, uh, yeah, I'd probably get a call from a lawyer saying, you know, stop doing it. We're going to take all of your money from you. And I'd laugh at them, say, ha, 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 fools, I have no money. But then they would take whatever, <laughs> you know, they take whatever. But it's because I don't have the authority to do that. But we have been given the authority to share the gospel. We are the distributors of this amazing thing that God has given us, this amazing purpose. So when, someone, when you tell someone about Jesus, you have the authority of the power in heaven behind you to go and to do that. That's why we do things in Jesus' name, not in our name, right? Because that's where the authority and the power comes from. Lastly, we have a priority of purpose. Jesus said, go therefore. That's a, a really short thing, but it's really powerful. Because long before companies had this vision of marketing and these mission statements, the church had a mission statement that goes like this. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. That's the mission statement that Jesus gave to his disciples, to the church, to go and to do. That's the mission statement. Go therefore means go. That means you can't, wait a minute, what do you mean go? It means I can't sit here and do nothing. I've got to go and do it. First Peter 2, 9 says this, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. He's called you. He said, it, it, but what Peter's saying there is you can show others the goodness of God. Right? We live in a harsh world. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world. There, there's no question. Just turn on the TV. You can't seem to escape it, but we can show the world the goodness of God. Right? I mean, because God is good. I mean, he, he's, he, he's good because just what he's done for us is, is amazing, right? Just the, the fact that he's with us always. I mean, look at the part of verse 20. And lo, I am with you always. Lo, L-O. It means see, look, exclamation point. Look it up. That's what the dictionary, it's like see, exclamation point, look, exclamation point. He's like, hey, listen, 
dude, I'm with you. Everywhere that you go, like exclamation point, I am with you. We have his presence with us wherever we go. And not only do we have it with us, but he says always, <coughs> always. Even when I go in to talk to people I'm afraid of, always. What if they don't like me? I, I, I'm going to confess to you this morning. I had a friend of mine, he was a new Christian, and he asked me this one time. He says, Mike, he said, I know I've got to go and, you know, evangelize. I've got to share the gospel, but what if they don't like me? And I said, it's okay. I don't like you. I'm still friends with you. Right? I mean, I'm still friends with you. I, I, who cares if they don't like you? Like, do you know them? No. Okay. What about my family? <laughs> They've long since stopped liking you. Right? I mean, they're family, right? That's what if, if families, we love each other. We don't always like each other. I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, I love my family, but there, I mean, there's a limit to that, right? But it, you understand it's not about us. It's about the good news. The good news is not going to them and saying, good news, I'm here. No, good news, Jesus is here. Good news is you don't have to earn your way into heaven. Good news, you are not your past. Good news, your sin has been overcome. Good news, hey, when you mess up tomorrow, because you will, Jesus paid for that too. Good news in your lowest moment, God loves you. Good news in your highest moment, God loves you. Good news, he loves you always. Good news, he's with you wherever you go, so you're never alone. Even if you're in a room full of spiders, you're not alone. Jesus is there, right? Amen. Like, because he needs to be there. Because if I saw a room full of spiders, I might be the one going home to be with the Lord because I might die of a heart attack. But you know what I mean? Like, there's good news. That's the good news. The good news is all of those things. Our past, our, our, our present, our future, all of the mistakes that we have, our bucket full of garbage, the, all of the, the, the crap we carry with us that we're trying to, to, these burdens that we have taken care of. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. I want to close with this story. In 1996, how many of you were, yeah, we have some people who weren't even alive in 1996, right? Okay. It's the year I graduated high school. But anyway, in 1996, Andrew Meekins, an elder in his church, the church of Addis Ababa, was on board a hijacked Ethiopian airliner, which was running out of fuel. It eventually made an emergency crash landing near the Comoros Islands. And according to those who survived the crash landing, Meekins stood up and spoke to the pe passengers, presenting the gospel to them before the crash. About 20 people in that flight received Jesus, including a flight attendant who didn't survive. That man stood in, those, in that aisle and presented the gospel to those people, and he didn't care what they thought. He didn't ask for permission. He did it because they needed the gospel. And he knew how desperately they needed the gospel because this was not going to turn out well for them. And he led 20 people on that flight to the Lord, including some people who didn't make it. We live in a world that has been hijacked by sin. It has been hijacked. We are running out of fuel. We are in the end. We are on our way to a crash landing, if you will. It is time for us to stand in the aisles and start presenting the gospel. It is time for us to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. There are people willing to stand, but you're called to stand in the aisle. The question isn't, for me, isn't, will I stand in the aisle? The question is, who's going to stand in the aisle with me? Who's going to be willing to stand up in a world that's hijacked and give them the truth that will set them free? 
Who's willing to be a missionary? Who's willing to take the Coca-Cola principle and say, I want every person in the world to hear about Jesus, right? We're going to get Jesus in the hands of everyone so that no matter where they are, I don't care the darkest uh, parts of the jungle in the middle of nowhere, they're going to hear the good news because I'm going to bring it with them, to them. It's interesting, this Coke bottle that I grabbed this morning, and I don't plan on drinking it because I don't really like Coca-Cola. Shh, don't tell anybody. But it has these like song things on the back. And I just, it was interesting. I just grabbed this one and says, lean on me. <laughs> Man, we have a God who says, lean on me. Right? Lo, I'm with you wherever you go always, even to the end of the age. He's like, lean on me because my burden is light. I'll show you, I'll teach you, I'll train you. I'll make you fishers of men because that's what we've been called to do. So let's be like evangelists like Coca-Cola evangelized, right? They, I mean, they didn't evangelize. They, they spread their propaganda. Why can't we? We actually have good news. We actually have something that is healthy for you. It is good for you. It is zero calories. It will give you energy beyond measure. We have Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We're so thankful. Lord, I'm thankful that you give us a purpose. And Lord, it is my prayer that each and every person would understand who they are in you and the purpose for which they have been given life. Lord, we are in a world that has been hijacked by sin. It's self-inflicted. Lord, we live in a world where your people haven't been about your business. We've been spending a lot of time, God, picking on each other, finding fault in one another, attacking one another, and destroying and trying to kill other believers because they think differently than we do. But we need to be about your business. You've given us a call and a purpose in life. And that call and that purpose is to go into all of the world. And Lord, in each and every one of us, we, we are called to be witnesses to you wherever we go. So if it's at school or at our jobs, in our families, in our neighborhoods. Maybe it's in our teams that we coach or we participate in, the different groups that we are members of, the churches that we attend, our cities, our towns, our counties, our states, our regions, our nations, the whole world. We have a purpose. And I pray like that little girl was saying, Lord, to her mom, that when people see us, they would see you in us because you, we would be bursting at the seams with you. But you know, maybe you're here this morning and maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of what Jesus did for you or maybe it's the hundredth time but now God has spoken to you and today and now is the moment that you're going to give your life over to him. That you are going to find out that you were created with a purpose to go and to do and that he is going to be with you wherever you go. Maybe that's the first time you heard it or maybe, again, God just spoke to you this morning. If that's you, I'm standing in the aisle of this hijacked world and I come in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ who came, who lived a sinless life, who died on a cross, a violent death in your place. And he did it because he loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. But he's given you a choice to make right now. Will you take the free gift that he bought, that he purchased, 
and that he freely gives, but he won't force it on you. You have to choose right now to take that free gift of salvation. I plead with you. I will crawl through a, a room full of spiders, but you are hearing and you're listening right now. And if that is you this morning, I want you to just say to Jesus this morning, say thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for rescuing me. This morning, right here, right now, I've heard your voice. I've heard you call to me. And I want to accept that free gift of your salvation right now. If you're saying that prayer for the first time, would you just raise your hand? I just want to be able to pray for you. I just want to be able to encourage you. If you've already made that commitment in your life, and you know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, then I want to say to you this morning, it is time to get up in the aisle. It is time to get up and it's time to start getting about the business of evangelism. It is far beyond time that we as a church, we as the body of Christ, we as God with skin on to the people around us, it is far beyond time for us to get serious about doing what we're called to do. No church program, no church building, no church color. None of those things matter if it's not about giving the good news to the people who are drowning and dying in a world without Jesus. We are called, we are commissioned to go there for and do. So I'm calling upon you this morning, church. Go there for and do. Jesus, the Savior of the world, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, has commissioned you to go and do, to bring the good news to those around you. He has called you to go into all of the world, to proclaim the gospel, the good news, to make disciples, teaching people what he has taught you, not so you can keep it to yourself, so that you can give and give and give, and so that together we, the body, God's plan A, his only plan to bring the gospel, to share it with all of the world, to make sure every single person has heard the name of Jesus Christ and has heard the good news that he died for them. He has placed it in your hands for you to go and to do. And if you don't do it, no one else will. And if we don't do it, people will have an eternity in hell without God. It is our responsibility. Now is the time. We have been called. This is the place. Go therefore and do. Father God, I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.